Father, we just want to thank you for this day. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the opportunity that we have together to come together and get into your word. Father, as we step into this new series, that you would guide us, you would lead us, you'd direct us, that the words that we share are the words from your heart, Father, the words from heaven, and that we would have ears to hear and hearts to receive. And may this word be transformational in our lives and bring fruit for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Today we're talking about the net, part one. The net, part one in this series called The Net. And I want to look at some scripture today. Now this is really where we see this, this, this thing about a net really for the first time. And, uh, and we see it right here in the story of Peter when Jesus calls Peter and some of the other disciples to follow him. So let's look at this. It starts out in Luke chapter 5, and, uh, and we're going to begin reading, uh, I think we're in verse number 11, verse number 11. But Luke chapter 5, we've got it on the big screen. It says, One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. So the scene, you can only imagine. I, I've been to where I think they think that location was. And it's a hilltop, and it's almost like a natural amphitheater along this hillside with the lake, the Sea of Galilee, being toward where Jesus is uh, back. And, and, the, and the crowds kept getting bigger and bigger, and he was running out of room. He's on the shore, and then he gets into a boat. And the beauty of it is uh, when you're, that sound is so reflected so well on water that Jesus knew that this would make it even better and everybody would be able to hear. So it says that he was, he was pressed. Uh, he had pressed in on him to listen to God's word, and he noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out to, uh, into the water. He sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. Now, this Simon is Simon Peter. That was just his first name, Simon Peter. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper, and let's let down the nets, and let down the, your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and did, didn't catch a thing, but, and I can only imagine, like what happened right there? He said, we worked all night, we didn't catch a thing, so Peter didn't want to go to all that trouble. He was washing the nets well, a few minutes ago, right, earlier, right? And now Jesus is telling him to go back out. And he, he doesn't know who Jesus is. He's thinking, what does this guy know about fishing? And, and, and I can only imagine, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was this look that Jesus gave him because something happened, and then Peter said, but. Can you imagine that? He says, Master, we've, we've fished all night. We didn't catch a thing. And Jesus is just looking at him. Can you imagine those eyes, Jesus' eyes? And, and Peter says, but, but. And here's what he said. He said, but. He said, but. If you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time, listen to this, and this time their nets were so full of fish they began to tear. Now make note of that in your mind. They began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in, uh, in the other boats, and soon both boats, both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh, Lord, please forgive me. I am such a sinful man. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish that he had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they had landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Isn't that amazing? That's a pretty powerful story, isn't it? Let's look at the next time we see the net, this thing about a net and Peter in connection. Really, you could just fast forward from that moment, three to three and a half years forward, and you come to this next moment, which is found in John chapter 21, verses 1 through 17. Let's take a look at this. Chapter 1, it says, Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Canaan of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. 
We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. Now, this is, listen, this is post the three, three and a half years that they had spent with Jesus as disciples. Can you imagine all they saw in those three to three and a half years? I think it was John that wrote, or one of them wrote, that if, if all the things Jesus had done had been written, probably the books of all, in all the world couldn't contain it. He did a lot in three, three and a half years. These guys saw most of, if not all of it. But listen, their disappointment led them to go back to what they were familiar with. It wasn't their disappointment that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. It wasn't even their disappointment that he had been raised from the dead because by this time he had already shown them, himself to them in the upper room. But their disappointment in, it, it was in how this thing was playing out. See, they didn't, they didn't have any doubt about who Jesus was. They just didn't understand what he came to do in its entirety. They still thought that as the Messiah... He was going to come set Israel free from their captivity that they, they were in with the Roman government. And they were disappointed. We also saw that those two that were on their road, on the road from Jerusalem back to uh, Emmaus, they were walking on the road of disappointment. So this disappointment led Peter to go back. He just did not understand this. He says, I'm just going fishing. I don't understand all this. I don't get it. I love Jesus. I appreciate him, and I know he's resurrected, but I don't understand this. And he says, I'm just going back to fishing. I'm just going back to what I did when I started all this. He said, I'm going back to fishing. And listen, leadership is influence. And Peter, as a natural born leader, had influence. And those others said that they were going to go too. And they did. We'll come too. And they fished all night, and they caught nothing. Next verse says this, uh, verse number four. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples could not see who it was. And he called out, fellas, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your nets on the right side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't, listen to this, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple Jesus loved, then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter. Now, who in the world was that? That was John. We've talked about that before. John wrote the, the book of John, and then first and second and third John. But John, listen, he got his identity not in who he was, but in the knowledge that Jesus loved him. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? And we've talked about this before. Can you imagine being, being John? Or what if I said that everywhere I went, the one whom Jesus loved? And I introduced my wife and, and, and me together. I said, hey, this is my wife, Jen, and I'm the one that Jesus loves. That's how he talked, though. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? He said, and he wrote the whole book of John based on that. When he ever referred to himself, he just called himself the one whom Jesus loved. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, that's John, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard it, that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work. He jumped into the water and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded uh, net to the shore, for they were only about 100 yards from shore. And when they had got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over charcoal fire and some bread. Bring the fish that you caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now, this is interesting. See, that, did, that wasn't in there just to fill up some space. There's a specific reference and a connection being made right here to the first time you saw the net and to this second time you saw the net. And it specifically says there were 150 large, 53 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And then Jesus served them bread and fish. This was the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he'd been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these do you love me more than these, talking about these fish, these, these 153 big fish? Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, a third time. Isn't that interesting? That's not by happenstance either. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? 
three times. Proverbs says, life and death and the power of the tongue. He that loveth it, tends it like a farmer, tends a garden, will eat the fruit thereof. Jesus, in his love for Simon Peter, they'd already had a private face-to-face meeting that we really don't know much about because it was private and personal. And, but now, listen, Jesus is bringing Peter back to the beginning. And you remember what he first said to him. He said, hey, follow me because I'm going to teach you how to be fishers of men. And now Peter, out of his disappointment, has returned back to what he thought he knew before he knew or knows what he knows now. But the Lord Jesus wasn't. He was like, Peter, you, 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 you weren't created to be a fisherman of fish, but a fisherman of people. And, and the third time, here's what happens. Jesus repeated, and a third time he asked him, verse 17, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. But he was more hurt when his eyes met Jesus a few nights earlier. And he saw Jesus and he was reminded of what Jesus had told him after that rooster had crowed. The Bible says he went away in anguish. He was completely hurt. Third time, he said, Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Two quick things that we can pick up really quickly by looking at this. And that is, number one, that the net, the first net and the second net represent something. What does it represent? Listen, I believe without any doubt it represents the church. The church. The net represents the church. The net represents the church because... In both stories, God used the net to catch fish, and then he equates the fish to people. And he's asking Peter, Peter, do you love me enough to leave this net that you know can catch some fish? Because this one's working and the first one wasn't. But do you love me enough to leave this kind of fishing and to turn toward a different kind of fishing that I'm calling you to? And that is the same call that I gave you when I first met you. And that is that fish or that call to fish for people. That's what he's asking him. So I I believe it's just really easy to see that the net in both of these accounts represents. It's a picture of the church. It's a picture of the church. And And the net, listen to this, the net is used, the net that is used to catch fish, but the fish really represent people, people. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Here's the second thing I see. Look at this. The fish, the fish, the fish become sheep, which speaks of transformation. A totally different kind of animal. It goes from a fish to a sheep, but that speaks of transformation. Fish are slimy. Listen, and of course, they're going to die pretty quickly once they come out of water, right? If left, left unattended to, they'll begin to stink. They'll start stinking before you can get back to the shore good. You can just open up your cooler and you smell the. You can just smell the fish, right? But the longer they sit out of their, their place where they were caught, the more that odor becomes larger, right? So those fish need something. Listen, listen, that's like people. See, we're slimy. We got the world all over us, all in us, and, it, and we stinketh. There's a stink to us. Right, But God wants to bring about a transformation that changes us into a whole new creation, one that never existed before. And that's what he says that the gospel does. It transforms our heart and makes us a whole new creation. Nothing that even resembles. I mean, there's nothing really that I think a fish and a sheep have in common at all. Just like, listen, there's nothing common in common between a fish, a slimy sinner, listen, and a saint. And that's what you and I become after we've been transformed by the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the net represents the church. Listen, the fish represent people that are caught. But listen, right here, Jesus is not just calling him to catch fish, but he's calling him to feed and care for the sheep. Once transformation begins to happen in the life of that convert, he wants them to become a disciple. Jesus said it as he was 
exiting the earth. He said, I want you to go into all the world and make disciples of all people. Make disciples. So there's a call not to just catch the fish, Peter, but I want you to feed and care for my sheep, my sheep. So I think that's really easy to see. Now here's what's interesting. The very first time we see the net at play in Scripture, it didn't work. The net began to tear. And listen, Scripture is so clear in making sure we see the contrast of a net that was full but began to tear and, and, and break apart and a net that was full of big fish and work. And inter isn't it interesting? These weren't just any kind of fish, but these were large fish. These were fish that had been caught, but they're, they're larger now. And it, it really shows a growth and a metamorphosis that's happened. And these fish go from fish to large fish to sheep, which is a whole new creation, which represents transformation. But see, the net the first time didn't work, but the net the second time works. It works. So we're talking about in this series the net, the net. And here's what I believe. Listen, listen. Here's what I believe. I believe that the Lord wants to teach us how to make sure that the net works. Because when you have a net that works, you know what you have? You have a network. You have a network. Listen, and as an individual believer touched by and transformed by the power of the gospel of grace, you and I become a network in the net. We, become a, we get caught by the net, and then we become transformed, and then we become a part of the net that God uses to catch more fish that are turned into sheep. But it's a net that works, and we're part of, listen, God's network of believers. And that's the church. And, and we'll go into it in this series, but, I mean, just think about a net. What is it? It's, it's strands that are bound and wound together and then knotted and then repeated and then repeated and then repeated until you got a net of just as big of a net as you need. And that's exactly what he's trying to do in our lives and in our hearts. But see, it helps to see the big picture, right? Because if you don't really understand this basic principle, sometimes it's really hard to decide and understand what the church is for, right? The church is the net and you're part of the net that makes the net work and we're part of the network. You see, the church is not some building, right? It's not that church down there and that church down there. It's we, the church. We're the church. We're the, see, this is, this is church. I go to church on Sunday. Where do you go to church? Well, I go to church at the Turner's Theater. I didn't know the Turner's Theater was a church. I thought it was a theater. Well, it actually is a theater, but I'm part of the church. And we as a church, we meet at the Turner's Theater because we're the church and the building's not the church. Oh, I understand now. You see? It, 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 you see? You see what I'm saying? But see, listen, we, if you want to call this a church, we make this a church. But this wouldn't be a church without the church making it a church. And listen, if you're going to go to all the trouble of being in a church and being a part of a church, and, and, and what makes you a part of it, whether you realize it or not, is being a believer and being saved and being born again, don't you want to be a part of a church that works? A part of a church that works? Now, some could say, yeah, bless God. See, I knew, uh, yep, we need to work. As a church, we need to work. Now, listen, as a church, we need to rest in the work that's already happened, and that's the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and the work that he's now continually doing through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about that in this series. So today we're letting the foundation, we're laying the foundation and we just see quickly, easily, it's really simple, that there's, there's serious metaphor, typology, and analogy between one net and another net and, an, and one net that doesn't work and another net that works. And that they're used to catch fish, but it's not really fish God's trying to catch. He's trying to catch people in the network, in the network. So, what makes the net work? What makes a net work? Now, can I be honest with you? There's, there's micro and there's macro, right? I'm not so much a micro person where you really focus in on the details. That's why I'm so thankful for my wife because she's a very detailed person. And one of the things she told me when we met is there's something you need to know about me, and I'm a planner. 
And I pick on her about this all the time. And, and I'll say, I'm a planner. And she is a planner. And thank God for that. See, she keeps the record of every date of everything we got to do. And I keep a record too, but just in my heart. <laughs> but she puts it on paper. And I'm so thankful for that because I'm always asking, now, what do we got coming up? What are we supposed to do? Right? But see, I'm a big picture person, and I'm always looking at the macro. I'm looking at the big picture, right? So let me give you some big picture real quick. And see, I love that because in the net, you got macro and you got micro. You got the big picture, but then you also got the details of each strand and each knot that connects the net and makes the net work. And you got to have both. Amen? Now, let me give you some big picture. We are the church at large, and we're all part of the big net. Every church that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he says this. He says, now I know they may not be, ba-. see, Peter, uh, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, there's some folks down there, and they're baptizing a- 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 in your name, but they're not of us. Should we go stop them? He said, hey, no, 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 don't stop them, because if they're not against me, they're for me. Now, that's important, because there's a lot of churches out here, and we don't all do it the same. We got our own little ways and our own little traditions, and, and, and that's okay to a point. And I, I get that. What I don't want to do, though, is I don't want to put my faith and my trust in tradition more than God's Word because Jesus said the traditions of men make the Word of God of no effect. So if i got to choose between God's Word and the tradition, I might have to go with the Word, right? But there's lots of churches out here in the, in the macro that make up this net, but... And I'm not trying to, I'm not down in anything or anybody. I'm just saying, but not every, every, every net, every church in the net works. What do you mean? Well, just go down to where I put my little boat in sometimes, behind sheets on, uh, on uh, what's the road right there? Y'all help me. Clark's Neck Road, right? There is the most beautiful church right across from that boat landing. Now, I don't know a thing about that church, but I know it hadn't always been the way it is right now. And somebody used to go there. Somebody more than likely got saved there, baptized there, grew up there. And today that church is, is grown up. Now it makes for a nice picture. If you want a really cool picture in front of that family portrait, that's a cool, that could be on an album cover. That could be in a, a nice photographer could picture that. You could frame it. But the sad part is so something happened. I don't even know what, I don't know what denomination, I don't know anything about it. I just know that that, that, that net stopped working somewhere. You with me? It's something stopped. Something stopped growing. Something stopped working. And, and it, it's beauty. It's beautiful now in its decay because it's just old. It's historical. But it's not working. It's not, listen, it's not doing what it was built to do when it was built and when it was brand spanking new. You see? Now, here's what that tells me. If that could happen to that church... Now, we're not talking about the big church. We're talking about the individual micro now. That could happen to any church. That could happen to Harbor Church. And instead of Harbor Church growing like I really believe God is going to continue to do, it could get smaller to where it's nothing, and we end up just like that. So if I'm going to be part of the net, that I, I just want to be a part of the net that works and keeps on working, and we grow and somebody says, well, I don't want you to be a part of a big church. Well, you know what? You have a hard time in heaven because heaven's big. <laughs> Amen. Now, you know, it's nothing wrong with big, but we, we got to stay connected, though. That's the key. No matter how big you get, you got to stay connected. You got to be knotted together, right, and connected together. That's what, that's what makes the net work. If the net, if the net stops being connected, it'll stop working, too, you see. And then it's just like it's the, nobody knows each, anybody. Nobody connects with one another. It's just a big church for the sake of being a big church. It becomes like a company and a corporation. We don't want that either. I just want the net to work. Amen. And if I'm going to be a part of a net, I want that net to work in Jesus' name. So what, that, what does that mean? It means I need to learn what makes the net work. And I need to stay and walk and keep my focus in the truth and the knowledge of what really makes the net work. So part number one, we're talking about the net. And then in this series, each week, we're going to talk about what makes the net work, that makes it a network. And today, I want to talk about the first one as we close. You ready? Close number one. The net tore, and then it worked. And you know what's interesting? Jesus told Peter, I'm going to show you how to be a fisher of men, which is actually better than what you're doing right now, because you thought you was a fisherman, but you didn't even use a good net, and it tore. Isn't that interesting? 
he, he's basing the calling. He's giving Peter the last picture he gives him is with a net that works and catches a whole lot of big fish. Isn't that interesting? So what makes the net work? A lot of things make the, make the net work. But I will say this, the basis of the net working is founded on what I'm about to tell you. And this isn't programs. It's not, it's not a bunch of things. It's a truth. It's a truth. And what makes the net work, and this is the foundation for what makes the net work, it's based on this. It's because of the Father's heart and Christ. It's based on the Father's heart and Christ. Now, if I said to you, what Bible story illustrates is the best illustration of the Father's heart? And you could easily say, well, the story of the prodigal son, which isn't how that should be named anyway. The, the, the Holy Spirit didn't name it that. It's just the writer and translators of, of Scripture. They, they put these headings up there to, so we'd see the different topics and it'd be easy reference for you and me. And someone just got the idea that the main emphasis in this story is the prodigal son. But it's not. The main emphasis in that story is the father's heart. You see, it's not about the prodigal son. It's not about how bad. What's the biggest thing? It's not how bad the, bad the boy was. It's how good and loving the father was in the story. That though this boy cursed this father to his face, he said, I just rather you be, I wish you were dead right now. And because you're taking too long to live, give me my inheritance now so I can go have fun. Whoa. And you know what the father did? He didn't slap him. You know what he did? He gave it to him. He gave it to him. He let him go. And the Bible says that that boy went off and he went off a far, to a far place and he spent everything he had on riotous living. I don't know what to find riotous living, but it, it, it was pretty riotous because he ended up spending everything he had. He ran out of money. He's in the farmer's pig pen tending pigs, which is so opposite of what Jews shouldn't have anything to do with pigs. Jesus is telling this story to a group of Pharisees and Sadducees and he's, 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 he's ringing all kinds of bells in this story. And, and someone said, and I, I believe it. Somebody says, I really believe it was more than a story. I believe it was actually, it, it was an account of something that happened. That, that's possible. But nevertheless, listen, no matter what this boy did in, 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 in disrespect to this father, the father still loved him unconditionally. Powerful. That, you know, this boy is in this place feeling, feed, feeding the pigs didn't have anything to eat, and the farmer wouldn't let him eat the food for the pigs. And then he came to himself. And some would say, well, he got exactly what he deserved. That's exactly where he ought to be, talk to your mom and daddy like that. I understand, right? But that's not what he got, because the Bible says he came to himself, but he came to himself with, with the mentality of a lot of people today in the church. Well, I'll just go back to my father's house, and I will just be a servant. Because I'm not worthy to be a son anymore, I'll be a servant. And there's so many folks in the church today, they're in the church and they're in the house, but they've never moved from servanthood to sonship mentality. And they're serving the Lord. Bless God, we need to come together to serve the Lord. And you hear this phrase, serve the Lord. That brother serves the Lord. It's not about how you serve the Lord. And your world should not be based on you serving the Lord. Your world should be based on you being a son or daughter of the Most High God. And out of that, you will serve, but you'll serve from your sonship, and you won't serve as a servant. You see, that's why people talk about, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm not worthy. And people start out prayers like that. Father, we're not even worthy to be called your sons, and we're blah, blah, blah. We're lowly. And that's a bunch of hogwash. It's religious. It's religious, and the devil's behind it. And the devil likes for us to stay there as believers because he doesn't ever want us to move into our sonship, who we are in Christ. We're a whole new creation. We ain't fish no more. We're sheep. We've been transformed. Amen? And only the gospel can do that. And when that boy, he had his, he had his speech down, he, he got close to home. The Bible says the father saw him away off, and he ran, and fathers didn't run. This is another big alarm bell going off for all those here. Fathers didn't run. The family ran to the father. The father didn't run to the children. He ran. He fell on his son's neck in his filth, and he kissed him, and he put a ring. And the boy started out with his speech, but the father didn't even want to hear it. He said, hey, go get a ring, put it on his finger, a robe, put it on his back, shoes, put it on his feet, and we're going to kill the fatted calf and have a party because my son who was lost now has returned home, and we're going to celebrate. That's exactly what they did. And that's the picture of a loving father. 
Now, there was another son that got mad. You know, there's elements, even within the church, that doesn't like to know how good God is. It offends them that God really is as good as he is. You know, Oral Roberts came out years ago, and and there's a pattern with Israel. I won't get into a lot of this, but so goes Israel, so goes the church. So goes Israel in the natural, so goes the church in the supernatural and in the spirit. And as Israel became a nation in the 1940s, uh, the revival, healing revival began to break out in the land. And, and, and different people begin to rise up and preach about healing and the goodness of God. And something old Roberts would say is that God is a good God. And he said, something good is going to happen to you. And he'd put these tents up around the country, and people would come across all denominational lines. And old Roberts himself was Methodist. But he began to preach this, and people got mad at him saying that God was good. Really? So you'd rather God be bad. Because they're basing everything on the Old Testament God and not the New Testament, New Covenant Father that Jesus is portraying in that story. Listen, it's not called the bad news. It's called the good news. And if, if God is love, does anything bad come out of love? No. No. Listen, good stuff comes out of love. And he calls this the good news, the gospel. Translated literally means the good news. But sadly, just like that brother who got offended, he was all about his works. I've worked for you my whole life and you've never... He said, listen, but you've always been a son. You may not have been walking in your sonship, but you've always been a son and you could have had anything you wanted at any moment if you'd have just taken it. Isn't that interesting? Now see, his net won't work him. He had a messed up network. But listen, the gospel and the good news isn't founded on servanthood and servantship like he was focused on. It's it's focused on what that son received that was rebellious, that was in sin, and deserved hell. But he got heaven in return. Big difference, isn't there? What's another story that depicts this? this? This love of a father to a son. I was reminded of it recently when I was doing my daily Bible reading. And I'm reading the story of David and Absalom. If you know this story about David and Absalom, Absalom was, I don't know if he was the oldest son, but he was one of David's older sons. David had many sons from different wives, and we don't do that nowadays. We have one wife, right? But back then they had multiple wives. David had multiple wives, and he had multiple sons from different wives. And this one son he had from from one of his wives was Absalom. Absalom was a handsome young man. He was fit. He had beautiful long hair, cut his hair once a year. And they talked about how much it weighed. It was heavy. I think like five pounds. It was really heavy. But he was into himself. Absalom was into himself. He, he avenged his sister's rape. She was raped by her half-brother, a brother from another mother. And, 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 and he was infatuated with her, lusted after her, raped her. And that was bad. But Absalom took revenge, and he killed that half-brother two years later. It made David extremely angry. Absalom left the kingdom, stayed gone for a couple years. Uh, Joab intervened on David's behalf, and David was brought back into the presence of the king. But, but Absalom didn't really want that. He wanted his father's throne. And so the Absalom spirit says, I'm going to turn away the affections and the heart of the people I'm going to create my own thing. And that's exactly what he did. He'd go out by the city gate every morning. He hired people to follow him like he had his own following and his own ministry and his own thing going. And he'd go out by the gate every day. And as people would come in to go see the king, uh, to, to bring their case before the king to get a judgment, he would, he would befriend the people. He'd kiss their hands. He'd dote over them. And he said, well, you know, if I was the king... I would hear your, your, your case, and I would judge this because you got a really good case, and, and I'd really rule in your favor. And he did this for a couple years out there every day, and he began to woo the hearts of the whole kingdom toward him and away from his father, David, who was the king. He was completely out of order. And really, you see that in, that, in what we call the Absalom spirit, which is closely connected with the Jezebel spirit. Really interesting. But Absalom, Absalom has characteristics that shows up a little different, but he was trying to woo and sway the hearts of the people away from God's divine order to himself. And he did a good job at it, to the point where he put a plan together and he, 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 he basically took over. He took over. And he took, he took basically 
the majority of the followers of, of Israel became his subjects. And he, he listen, he self-coordinated uh, himself, ordained himself to be the king. And he, he made himself king at Hebron. And, and now he's on his way to Jerusalem to take Jerusalem and to kill his father David. And David gets word and wind of it, and he and his followers and band of true, true followers, true believers, they follow him and they escape Jerusalem. And they're out in the wilderness, and their hearts are just torn. They're weeping and they're mourning on their way out. It's a very low point in David's life. And this Absalom is so brazen, he goes back and he takes the wrong advice, and he sleeps with his father's wives in open public. I mean, just to, just to pay his father the ultimate insult. There were ten wives left behind, concubines. And he went on the top of the palace of the roof of the palace, set up a tent so the whole city could see. Isn't that crazy? I mean, and it was just pure degradation what this boy was doing. And he was after his father's throne, and he wanted his dad to be killed and dead. Isn't that interesting? Now, what, would, what do you think David's response would be? I would think David would want him killed too. And listen, David had an army that was with him, but Absalom had an army. On this one particular day, they meet in battle, and they fought all day, and 20,000 people were killed. And Absalom, and before David's soldiers go out to meet them in battle, David was going to go out and lead them, but the leader said, no, David, you can't go with us. You go stay over here. We want you to be safe. You're the king. We want you to be safe. We know Absalom wants to kill you, and if he gets a chance, he's going to do it. David said, okay, y'all go. You go. He said, but please, whatever you do, this is what he said now. Whatever you do, please be merciful to young Absalom. Please be merciful. Now, Absalom, Absalom wasn't that young, but it's like he was referring to him as, whatever you do, just be merciful to my little boy. Crazy, isn't it? Heat of the battle, the battle's happening, battle's raging. It's toward the end of the day, 20,000 people have died. And Absalom sees Joab, which was David's commander. He sees him, and jo Joab goes out in pursuit of him. And Absalom is riding on his mule away from the battle. And his long flowing hair, you know the story, gets caught in a branch, and it wraps around a branch. The, horse keep, the mule keeps running, and Absalom is hanging there by a branch from his hair. The thing, the thing he thought he was all about, he was all about his hair, ends up hanging him. And he's hanging there with his hair. And, and finally, uh, one man comes along. He's going to take Absalom out. And another man says, no, I think it was Joab. said, no, let me do it. I'd rather, because David's not going to be, he's going to be upset when he finds out what happens. And sure enough, he put four daggers in Absalom's heart and he's killed. And now someone's got to tell David what's happened. And you would think that David in the natural would, would be glad that his enemies have been defeated to include Absalom. And he can go back to taking his rightful place as king. But look at his response. Look at his response. His response is found. His response is found. Let me find it. Let me find it. Here we go. Let me find it. Yeah. His re response is found in 2 Samuel 18, 32 and 33. It says, The king asked the Cushite, the messenger, who had come to give him the message. He's telling about what happened, that they're victorious. And then king, the king, David, asked the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom safe? And the Cushite replied, May the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise up to harm, him, harm you be like that young man. In other words, he got what he deserved. The, the Cushite, the message, he got what he deserved with the rest of them. And the Bible says this in verse, 30, uh, verse 33. The king, David, was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, Oh, my son, Absalom. My son, my son, Absalom. If only I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Now, I get the prodigal son story, and I'm very thankful for that. But this one, this one is, is, even, is even more different. I mean, the degradation by which this Absalom dishonored his father is really nothing in compared, compared to the prodigal son. But yet, listen, listen. You hear David's heart toward the son in spite of everything that son had done. And he did the worst. And here's what he said. This capsulizes it. He says this. He says, if only I had died instead of you, instead of you. Now, what's he saying there? As a parent, 
And you don't have to be a Christian parent to, to pr want to protect your children. I mean, tornadoes were sweeping through some areas in the Midwest, and I saw the accounts on TV, and a woman gets her kids in the bathtub, and she's laying over the kids. I don't know that she's born again, saved, and I don't know that she's, a, she's still a fish and probably not a sheep yet. But yet there's a natural instinct instead of, inside of any parent. You, you, you don't even have to be a believer to want to protect your children. And you would take the harm. Just We're talking natural now, not even super on the natural. We're not talking about super now. We're just talking about in the natural. There's a natural love that parents have that you would, first of all, without thought or thinking, you would protect your children without even thinking about it. Am I right? Come on, amen. Y'all with me? You shake your head. Let me, let me get an amen. Come on, amen, moms and dads, right? Amen. We just had Mother's Day. We got Father's Day coming up. You'd do anything you could in a moment without thinking about it to protect your children. If it came down in a moment's notice to your life or theirs, what would you do? It's going to be yours. You don't even have to think about it. You don't have to weigh it. You don't have to say, hey, give me a few weeks to think about this and I'll get back to you. It is boom. You would step in front of the bullet, you'd step in front of the bad guy, you, 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 you'd step in front of the bear, whatever, to protect your child. Which means as a parent, listen, your heart is more for that child than it is for you. And to me, this is probably, see, and see, this didn't make any sense. In fact, later in the very next chapter in this story, Joab comes to David and says, David, you are in here weeping and crying over a man that wanted to kill you, and people have died for you, David, and you're hurting them right now because your, your affection is thwarted. And David says, you're right. And he got up, and he, put his, he, he anointed his face, and he, got, and he got himself together. Listen, but that didn't affect his heart. You see, it made no sense in the natural that you should still love this boy, and you should mourn for him, and you're saying that you had rather been the one dead than him after all he did against you. But that was the Father's heart. Listen, and that's our Heavenly Father's heart. And we see it. Two quick verses. Everybody knows them. Every believer probably knows them. Found in John 3, 16 and John 3, 17. Let me pull it up for you. Here we go. Ah, oh, where is it? John 3, 16, it says this. Listen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believeth in him, stop for a minute on that. For God so loved the world that he did what? Gave his only begotten son. The, in other words, he gave, he didn't have two or three, he had one. And he gave, for God so loved the what? The world. The dirty, nasty, fishy smelling, Absalom looking and acting like world. God loved the world so much that he gave what? Not even himself. He gave his son. Whoa. So that whoever would just act right, do right, straighten up, and act like you ought to, nope. So that whoever would just simply believe would not perish but have everlasting, abundant, zoe, life to the full till it overflows. And God sent his son into the world. He sent his son to death, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Sozoed. Saved, healed, delivered. It's all included. Then you add salvation to it. Saved, healed, delivered, preserved, protected, made prosperous, made whole. To have nothing missing and nothing broken. He sent his son into the world. Don't see, we know David's heart. David had rather died than it been Absalom. You had rather it be you than your children. But yet, listen, he loved his son so much, but he loved you and me as much or more that he sent him to die for you and for me. That's amazing, isn't it? Listen. Peter, and I'm not going to read the verses. Peter, Peter, all right, what makes this network? What makes this network? Two things. The heart of the Father and Christ Jesus. The two are in combination. The heart of the Father in that the Father loved the world so much that he would give his son, Jesus Christ, who was what? Just some person? No. Peter, Peter and the disciples, the rest of the disciples are at 
Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus asked this question. I'm not going to take time to read it. He says, hey, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some say Elijah. Some say John the Baptist come back from the dead. He said, well, who do you say I am? And Peter stood up and said, hey, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Messiah. The Amplified breaks it out, the Messiah. The anointed. Christ wasn't his last name. Christ means the anointed one and his anointed. You were anointed by God to do something and to be the one, and that's who you are. And then Jesus responds, and he says, well, you're Peter, and that means rock. But upon this Petros, and that's the word rock in Greek, I'm going to build my church on the fact that I'm the Christ, the anointed one, and his anointing, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. The gates of hell won't prevail against it. So, and then, and then right in that same chapter, next series of verse, Jesus begins to talk about his death. He says, now I'm getting ready to be betrayed, but I, and I'm going to be crucified, but then I'm going to be raised from the dead on the third day. And listen, he says, I'm going to build my church on this truth. So it's built on the love of the Father, which is where it started, because he is love. But then the act and the demonstration of what Jesus did. This is what makes the net work, right? If you, start pre- you stop preaching Jesus in your church, you got a broken net, and your net don't work no more. And, and, and l- listen, you're going to somewhere cease to exist because you're leaving the foundation. It, it, listen, Jesus is the only way to get to the Father. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you start telling people they can get there a bunch of different ways, you're not the church anymore. Your net stopped working, and you're not even in the network anymore. Isn't that interesting? Because this, this is the foundation of the network. And it's got to be about Jesus. Listen, but it starts with the love of the Father and what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. I'm going to read this to you as we close. Look at this. So what is this then? How did it break out? Romans 5, 6 through 21. I'm going to read these scriptures, and then we're going to close. What Paul writes right here completely summarizes the whole gospel, which is the good news. Let me read it to you. Romans 5, 6 through 21. It says this. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for for an upright person. Though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. Now, we see this in the demonstration of fallen soldiers and Marines and airmen. They've, they've given their life for one another and for us, right? But he said, he said most people wouldn't do that. They're not most people. That's why we have at least one day of the year we celebrate, we call it, before, because they're not most people. But he's saying most people wouldn't die for a good person, much less a bad one. This is what he's saying right here, uh, especially when it's good. He said, but... God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Listen, you will never be condemned by the Father because you've been saved from that. You're not going to be condemned with the world. Watch out, judgment's coming. Judgment already came for you and me, and it was poured out on Jesus on the cross. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul said. We, we've escaped. He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since, we are friend, for, for since our friendship with God was restored by death, by the death of his son. What friendship is he referring to? That friendship that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden before sin ever entered into the picture. He's like, just like that, you got what they had. That's all been restored through the death of his son. While we were still his enemies, Absalom was an enemy. And while he was still an enemy, David mourned for his son. We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. You are not God's little servant. Listen, he, he, the only person he talks about being a friend in the Old Testament was like Abraham and, 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 and David. David was after his heart. But he called Moses a friend and Abraham his friend. Not many people got that status. But the Bible says right here, Paul says, you and I are called his friends. He considers us his friends, his friends. 
He says this, so now we can rejoice at this wonderful news in this relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. When Adam sinned, here's what he says, here's, here's how it works. Let me break it down for you. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given. But it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. This was the pre-law. Still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Even those who died not disobeying an explicit commandment of God as, uh, as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol and a representation of Christ who was yet to come. But there's a greater difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift for the sin of this one Adam brought death to many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. So if Adam's sin brought death to everybody, how much more this second Adam, Jesus, brought, brought God's grace and forgiveness to everyone. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin, for Adam's sin led to condemnation. But God's free gift leads to our being made right with God. That's called righteousness. Even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. How do we receive it? By faith and by believing. It's just that simple. That's amazing. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation to everyone, but Christ, one act of righteousness, brings at right relationship with God and new life to everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners, but because one person obeyed God, that's Jesus, many will be made righteous. That's you and me. We've been made the righteousness of God through him, Jesus Christ. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sin more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life, that's that word zoe life, the God kind of life that Jesus speaks about, the abundant life to the full till it overflows. Not just heaven when you die in the sweet by and by, but it starts the moment right here on this earth, amen? That It's a continuation, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that's the gospel summed up. Now let me ask you something, is there anything bad in that? Nothing. Does that sound like a whole lot of good news to you and me? That's exactly what it is. It's the good news. How we who were yet sin, though we were yet sinful, Christ died for us, and we became the righteousness of God. We became sinners because through Adam, but through Jesus, we became the righteousness of God through him. Now, can I just be honest with you? There's no mixture in that. That is nothing but pure, 100%, unadulterated, Grace of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I just read it to you, summed up in a few verses. That's the good news. Listen, and that's what makes the net work. The net is founded on the love of the Father and what Jesus Christ did on our behalf because the, because the Father sent him and gave him up for you and for me. Now that's what makes the net work. Now listen. If you don't preach the gospel like that and you believe in Jesus, but you still believe you're a sinner saved by grace and you need to live by the law, well, you'll still go to heaven. But I don't think you're going to live that abundant life that he's talking about because you're still feeling, fearing condemnation and judgment. You're living in the thou should nots and the I should and the I shouldn'ts versus who you are as a believer. Righteous, whole, all because of what Jesus Christ did for you and me on the cross. Amen? Now let's stand on our feet.